Good evening, welcome to this video. For this one I'll be doing the Lake Wake walk. Usually this walk's covered within 24 hours, but I'm gonna cover this one over four days. I'll be spending the night tonight in a and b in a small village called Osmovly, which is basically on the doorstep of the walk I'll be doing. I can't exactly say I picked a very good time to do it because as soon as I turned up, it started snowing. It's a pretty cool story about why I wanted to do this walk actually. When I was in my late teens, I designed a walk that was uh, stretching from one end of the Yorkshire Moors to the other. And I put it away. And a few years later, when I was in my early twenties, I was working on a retail park where I got talking to an old man who told me about the Lake Wake walk. And I looked back at what I designed and the walk is pretty similar to what I was doing and he told me about this way before I started doing long walks. I'm glad I didn't do it until now actually because looking back I really don't feel as if I was ready but now it actually means something to me. This walk I'll be going on it symbolises a lot of death and I don't really want to give anybody like a sob story or anything because I know we've all got them but since that old guy told us I've had a few people uh, close to me that has since passed away and I'd like to do it with them in mind, a bit of soul searching and I want to dedicate this walk to them because since the passing it's forced me to do a lot of personal reflection and as a result I've seen things and I've been to places that I couldn't ever even imagine um, I'd have been to. So I'm just going to give you a bit of a rundown of the plan of action and then I'll see you tomorrow. The Lake Wake Walk spans 40 miles or 64 kilometres across the Yorkshire Moors National Park. The trail I'll be walking consists of the highest elevation points of the entire North Yorkshire Moors, as well as the entangled labyrinth of wet, boggy evermoreland that stretches further than the eye can see. The old expanse of this land was once walked upon by the early Bronze Age people of Yorkshire. It's here where I hope to gain a glimpse of the lives they led and the hardships they endured before these modern times, as I tread their very footsteps experience what they themselves would have perceived with their own senses. For this one, I'll be working off Cicerone's North Yorkshire Moors Walking Guard by Paddy Dillon, which I would recommend buying, along with the correct ordnance survey maps and compass. The compass being particularly important. Day one will be the toughest walk, using a series of forest paths which lead to steep rugged hills and ridges at a total of 11 miles or 18 kilometres. Start by leaving Osmovely, heading north towards Arncliffe Wood and eventually hitting Beacon Hill just before Scarf Wood Moor. From here I'll be turning in a northeasterly direction, passing the natural locations of Colmire, Skugdale, Halfweight Green, Lave Moor, Holy Moor, Carlton Moor, and then onto Carlton Bank, where the path bends off towards the east, past Kringle Moor, Cold Moor, eventually passing the Wainstones which are a spectacular sight to see. Then on to Hasty Bank and finally Clear Bank where I'll be resting up for the night. I'll start day two by heading up towards Car Ridge, which leads me to Ura Moor, where I'll reach the highest point of the walk at Round Hill. From the starting point, I'll be following the mark points for Cleveland Way, as well as a few lightweight walk markers. Up until this point where I'll reach Blowworth Crossing along an old disused railway track bed. From here, I'll be using more natural marker points. I'll carry on walking over a disused railway path passing Middlehead, Dalehead, Westerdale, Findale Moor. I'll reach a road which leads me to the halfway point, the Lion Inn, which is located almost 9 miles or 14 kilometres from today's starting point. 
The terrain will be a moderate walk over high moors, but I'll have mostly good solid paths to hike on. After my last walk along the Wald's Way, I decided it best not to organise exactly where I'm sleeping. There are too many factors to account for, so I'll be keeping pretty much open to where I rest, and relying more on my knowledge of the outdoors to make a better judgement based on what opportunities are presented at the time. I'm hoping to start day three around the Lion Inn. This will be the furthest walk at almost 14 miles, or 22 kilometres, and becomes pretty tough, heading over the boggy outback of the Yorkshire Moors. I'll be carrying on along the last few roads around Rosedale Head, and then heading east over Savy Hill, towards Rosedale Moor, across the valley of North Gill, through to Hammer Moor, White Moor, Wheeldale Plantation, Wheeldale Moor, Wheeldale Beck, it's at Fenbog Nature Reserve where I hope to take my rest. I'll spend my final day covering more high moorland. For the most part, these paths are well kept with the exception of some rugged narrows, which are very wet in places, although it's much less boggy than the previous day. It will be a fairly steep climb for the next 9 miles, or 14 kilometres approximately. My starting point is going to be Elebeck Bridge which is just a few hundred yards from my resting point. From there, I'll be passing MOD property, crossing Ella Beck towards Flying Dales Moor, passing Juggerow Beck, Juggerow Moor, Stony Mile Moor, where I'll see a communications mast. Just past there is Stoop Brow, which becomes a steep descend into Ravenscar, where I'll be picked up from Ravenscar Hall Hotel, my final destination point. What would win life? Echoes of eternity. Morning, folks. It's almost eight o'clock in the morning. And if you haven't noticed, I've already stepped into a mini ice age. <laughs> Last night was one hell of a night. I had one of the most comfortable sleeps I've ever had in my life. It was nice and warm, which I kind of made, had to make the most of because it's going to be very low temperatures for this next few days. I had, a, I had a pub meal, steak and ale, pie with chips, and it was absolutely belting. And another thing that really made my night as well was a nice hot shower. Again, <laughs> something I won't be feeling much of for the next few days. Just started my walk. I've just left, left Osmovely and now I need to get all that stuff out of my system completely <laughs> and concentrate on navigation, the temperature. I hope it, if it stays like this, it's not bad as long as the wind doesn't catch up because of obvious risks of hyperthermia. I got talking to a couple of fellas from the village who's done the, the walk and they've said that it's absolutely riddled with adders which is Britain's only poisonous snake but to be fair with this weather I'm not sure if I'll be bumping into any of them much because even on nice days they are pretty shy and they're very sensitive to vibrations and they will move out your way when they sense your footsteps. The first thing worth noting on any adventure is the risks involved. The first being the obvious, slipping, tripping and falling to one's death. This trail extends to an altitude of 454 metres or 1,490 feet above sea level. 
It's rough terrain and steep hills are primarily the more important things to be aware of, especially during the first 10 miles or 16 kilometers. It's best to wear comfortable footwear designed for hiking, and I'd recommend some good sturdy hiking poles to remain well anchored to the ground. The whole terrain consists of trip hazards and slippery surfaces. Although very difficult to avoid, reducing these risks should be the top priority as they've been fatal in the past on many hikes. Cuts and bumps are minimal risks, although they can potentially lead to further health problems such as septicemia. It's extremely unlikely, but still best taking a first aid kit, along with a blister kit on this walk, as it's pretty remote in some areas. Also, another thing I'd like to add is try to familiarise yourself with basic first aid. Courses can be extremely expensive in this country, but buying a small reference book and studying on YouTube will get you much further than nothing. One thing that has me a little concerned is hypothermia, which is a medical emergency that occurs when your body loses heat faster than it produces it. The symptoms go from shivering, cold, pale and dry skin, low body temperature, irrational behaviour, a gradual slip into unconsciousness, a slow pulse and respiratory rate, difficult to detect breathing and pulse when unconscious, then death. Adequate clothing is essential for any adventure, as well as knowledge. Nobody was expecting temperatures like this. I just hope it don't get any colder. As beautiful as nature can be, it's been perilous over the years to millions that have met their unfortunate fate, one main reason being animals. As I mentioned, I've been told this place is infested with adders, growing up to 60 to 80 centimetres long. This short and stocky serpent is relatively easy to identify with its olive grey to red brown colour, along with zigzag pattern over its back. They hibernate from October to the end of March, coming back to life with the warm weather. You'll usually find them basking in the sun, or on the top of a warm rock. When startled, will typically retreat to a safe place such as a rocky wall or undergrowth. The poison generally presents little danger to a fully grown, healthy adult, although very painful as the wound becomes inflamed. The elderly, the young and the sick do face a higher risk. If bitten, you need to seek immediate medical attention. The final risk comes from a much smaller life form, but can be much more serious as it can latch itself onto you without your knowledge. The sheep tick. Pretty much most of the natural world is severely infested with ticks. Lamb disease, Lalupin virus, tick-borne fever, and localised skin infections have been recorded in humans, animals, and birds throughout the North Yorkshire Moors. It's strongly recommended that you do further research on ticks. Take maximum precautions to minimise the risk of being bitten as it can result in severe medical conditions, sometimes death. Right, so I'm about four miles in, and I ain't exactly tired. It's just last time I went for a nice big walk, I realised that the best thing you can do is take a break before you get tired, which helps recover. So at the moment, I'm just looking for somewhere where I can sit down and take a break. Uh, get a brew and uh, just chill out for a while. I've, uh, I've just come from up there and I've just seen the memorial for Bill Cowley who founded this walk and by the look of the landscape and what I've read of him he seems to be a bit of a mischievous type of character. <laughs> Farmer and local historian Bill Cowley created this walk in 1955 where he issued the challenge for walkers to hike their way across the moors from east to west within 24 hours. On 1st of October 1955, 10 men and 3 women set out at noon to perform the first crossing. They reached Ravenscar the next day at 10.30am and there the lightweight club was born. During the 1970s, when this walk had reached its pinnacle in popularity, 
People were travelling from all over the place in rates of around six to 10,000 per year. Whilst walking, you pass many ancient burial mounds. Because of this, and because many bodies were carried over the moors throughout town, Cowley felt it appropriate to name this trek the Lightweight Walk, which he took from the Lightweight Dage, a song first recorded in 1616, although it's thought to be much older. It describes the journey made across the dark and terrifying moors by a soul on its way to heaven, or hell, which was recited by the people who watched over the dead, until the time came to finally rest in eternity. Some groups have carried empty coffins across. Some have walked it dressed only in black, which is what I decided to do. So why do I say that Cowley was mischievous? On designing the walk, he said towards the end of the lightweight walk, you feel like death. You look at those tumuli, the ancient burial mounds on the moors, and you think, that guy in there is so lucky. He's found peace, whereas I'm still suffering. Right, so this seems to be a decent resting spot for now. Got nowhere to sit, but as, like, I, as soon as I took all the uh, weight off my back, I felt light as a feather. I've got a nice little water sauce, which I learnt from last time. Regardless of how much water I've got, always fill up when I've got the opportunity to. So as for the walk, so far so good. I'm enjoying it. The weather, as you can see, it's just, it's snowing, like just whenever it wants. Sometimes the sun comes out and I can see miles away if I'm high enough. And sometimes it's like this and it just snows. And when I get a little bit of a, little bit of a sweat on, my glasses seem to fog up. As far as sort of visibility goes, I can see the next like 50, yards ahead of me at all times pretty much so that's not a problem navigating i was i was probably more concerned about getting lost than anything else really and i didn't really want it to go like freezing but snow isn't that bad the wind has been pretty still which is a good thing i'm hoping that really doesn't pick up because wind chill factor can really really make a massive difference on today's trip. I'm relatively dry, like I say I had a bit of a sweat on, so hopefully I'll dry up by the end of this. One of the main focuses of today has been my pace. I can't afford to rush today because it can produce copious amounts of sweat. The weather has become so unpredictable. Last weekend, it was between 12 and 18 degrees Celsius. The forecast for the next few days says it's going down to minus three at night, which is not ideal if I'm dripping with sweat, but it could go even lower than that. So for now, I'm taking it slowly and taking the wind chill factor into consideration. It's not long until I see the steps getting increasingly steeper, which presents more risks. Cautiously, I tread the moors as if my very being begins to immerse itself in the discomforts of this frozen terrain. With very little help from the land, the day eventually turns into a success. Out here, it's the little things that keep the morale going. I must admit though, as uncertain as the whole situation was, I did feel enveloped by the spine-tingling electrical impulse of sheer adventure. That feeling of immortality you get, knowing that you must be watched over by your guardian angel. Good evening. I'm just going to record a quick one tonight because it is absolutely freezing. Uh, we've been between, I think, about zero and six degrees today uh, we've had a lot of um, a lot of snow coming down uh, we've had a little bit of sunshine a very little bit and on the ridges that I've been walking across the wind has been absolutely relentless on a more positive note though 
when I come out here I actually come out here to see the uh, Bronze Age burial mounds and I was I come across one and I was chuffed as hell uh, seeing that one I turned round at one point when I was at a really high ridge and pretty much saw the distance I walked from Os Motherly to where I was and I know I'd done some serious mileage and I saw it and as soon as, soon as I saw it I was like fuck me I couldn't believe how much sort of like distance I covered how much I saw um, and then I come across the steeps <laughs> which nearly killed me <laughs> uh, <laughs> but like I say it's a more positive note I hope there aren't as many tomorrow I think there will be but I'm going to have to see how it goes alright night morning I'm on day two and it's a bit of a late start today we had a nice big snowstorm last night <laughs> and all you can see all around me before I went to bed it was all green grass now I just got absolutely covered by a big blizzard and so first thing I did woke up Got myself a bit warm. I'm boiling a load of water now because I don't know what the water situation is like. I don't know if there's any uh, natural water places to, to get it from. So I'm just boiling the snow. I've had breakfast. And like I say, it's a bit of a late one. It's like 8.20, 8.30 or something like that. And that's it. I'm gonna probably spend about 10, 15 more minutes sort myself out and then I'll get a bit of a mooch on. The moment I got a move on, I began to feel instantly drenched in our prehistoric past. Archaeologists have done this country a huge service by delving into our history, although whatever items they have found, even by the thousands, are just dead fans when it has no context behind it. Unfortunately, a lot of what we believe about the people living in this time is mostly speculation. But I must say that being out here and walking these same hills as the Brigantes is exhilarating. It's out here where the old times began to breathe again. Life is a phenomenon experienced only by the individual. We tend to give meaning to past lives based on what occurs during our own. Trying to relate our own perceptions to what we could only guess would be theirs. We're all just as aware of our own impending end as they were of theirs. What we know for sure is that life is nothing but a tiny fracture of light glowing through an eternal chasm of an uncertain darkness. At some point in history, the myths of a creation began to justify our place in this world, giving rise to spiritual beliefs and practices. As we evolved from hunter-gatherer to farmer, we begin storing surplus resources this bought us time. The Brits who occupied this time period, this land wasn't just a resource given to us to exploit, it was much more than that. It seemed to have a life of its own. This was to be acknowledged and respected. Right, so I'm walking down Uramore now. And there was one natural landmark that I really wanted to sort of see and what I really wanted to put on video and show you. And that's Round Hill, which is the highest point, not only of this walk, but of the entire Yorkshire Moors as well. And apparently the views are absolutely spectacular. But unfortunately, I've been told that you have to go off the beaten track to sort of find it and my, my visibility has been a very poor today because of the, it's just been thick fog. I've probably been able to see probably between about 50 and 30 yards in front of me. 
and it's been absolutely cold really uncomfortably cold and so I've just been walking and walking one uh, ancient monument I did manage to come across though which which really did make things sort of better was base stone and there is another one called handstone but I hadn't managed to come across that one and this this part of the Mars is absolutely riddled with, with ancient monuments stretching back thousands of years because of the fog I've not been able to see so many natural landmarks so I have no idea what distance I've covered this morning the, within a, the space of about 15 minutes the fog just absolutely evaporated and the sun come out and I think the fog's coming back in now but let's hope I see come across some more monuments the area I'm walking through would have been considered sacred to the ancients it was the edge or a boundary of the world we inhabit close to the next where the dead resided usually these places was uninhabitable for the living these ideological concepts were given physical expressions as with some sites they even built mortuary enclosures and because rites of passage were transitions from one state to another i.e. births, childhood to adulthood, marriages, life to death and so on it required the removal of people involved from the main body of society such as villages and settlements this transition was witnessed away from the regular routine of a daily domesticated world to these divine places these rites would have been considered very dangerous as the soul passed from one state to another there would be very little in the way of a vengeful spirit wishing a curse upon the living such as disease, drought or famine and that was another good reason to keep it away from the Romans. as time unfolded the actual ceremonies themselves were long forgotten along with the DNA of those who conducted them however one thing is clear the barrows and mortuary structures left by these people were more than just memorials which serve only as a testimony to a departed soul there seemed to be communication points between the living and the ancestral forces that played key roles in the management of the landscape which directly affected people's lives right so I just passed the lion in which is the halfway point and I've had my first break unfortunately I've not really had a great amount of rest today well basically the hill it just has not stopped at all and the same with the wind it's just been absolutely relentless it's just not stopped so the only way to sort of stay warm out here at this temperature is to carry on walking so that's basically what I've been doing it's still pretty early so I can as soon as I find somewhere where I can stay for the night I'm going to take advantage of that hopefully we won't have any nasty horrible blizzards like we did last night on a good note the path has been uh, relatively close to all like ancient markings all sorts of monuments burials which to me it's been really grounding actually and it's been a it's kind of been a bit of a, a bit therapeutic if you like by around 3500 BC it seems family rights became formal perhaps routine as far as we know organised religion in the sense that we know it today did not exist and archaeological finds suggest that various rites would have taken place depending on the location and the time period cremation was rare in the early Neolithic period of Britain but known in Yorkshire and Ireland it became more common in the later Neolithic and early Bronze Age in the Middle Bronze Age cremation became the prevalent rite the building of tombs possibly began at around 4000 to 3200 BC in Britain and buried alongside the deceased were a number of items a dagger being the most popular some skeletal remains were also excavated with things such as pottery or arrow and spear tips in the possession 
Yorkshire yielded the most diverse number of grave goods that the ancients would have taken with them to the afterlife. The goods found in the graves seem to have been in better condition than the ones found in settlements, suggesting that those buried alongside treasured possessions, possibly created particularly for that burial, to show the status in the community. They were certainly aware of the movement of the sun and the moon, to which they implemented into the rites. They were also familiar with astronomy, but not to a very high degree. The positioning of the body played an important role, as some of them were positioned into the fetal position, facing the sunrise, could this have been an expression of rebirth? Some were mass burials and some were single graves. One skeleton even contained the bones of three separate people from three separate time periods assembled into the fetal position. This walk is beginning to feel very personal to me. I've been treading through a particularly in hospital environment where only the dead may rest. I can almost feel a presence guarding me like it's been there all my life, helping me out through the hardest times. I wade slowly through miles of bogland, my boat's full of frozen water, and the foul stench of decaying plants fill the air around me. I know full well I'm all alone in a dangerous spot, but I feel imbued with a sense of calmness that's radiating all the way through to my soul. I don't feel so alone. Wow, have I had one mental day today. <laughs> Let's start with the weather. <laughs> it was just waves and waves of hailstones, and they felt like bullets hitting me. <laughs> yeah, like hell. And then the wind was almost taking my head off. It was frozen wind as well, really biting. I realised how sort of like disconnected we are with the planet, with nature, with the the land the the tapping of my aching poles just listening to listening to like birds I mean you listen to birds but I was listening to like individual birds individual sort of animals and it was quite it was it was like a meditation I was just I was just walking plodding along didn't have a care in the world I don't know if I'm actually lost or not but <laughs> I, I ended up in a in a bog and I've been wading through loads of um, water, like, ankle deep. <clears throat> I don't know if I'm meant to be, I uh, don't care to be honest with you, I'll sort that out in the morning. Considering, sort of like the weather, <laughs> I've, I've enjoyed it today. And I found this special little hobbit hole as well, uh, which I'm stashed in. It's frozen outside. I was looking for like a treat or something, anything. Uh, in the bog to pin my tarp up and get some sleep, but then I found this and I was like, oh. <laughs> and uh, things got a lot better, <laughs> a hell of a lot better. My attitude got better, and I know I'm ahead, so I've got plenty of time. And I can probably wake up at about nine o'clock anyway, so I never sleep in. So I'm happy about that. Not much else to say, really. So I think I'll just call it a night. Good morning, about nine o'clock. I woke up about an hour and a half ago and I'm in my little observation post. <laughs> this kept me really warm. It was really cold, really windy as well. As soon as I went to sleep, that was it. The, the next thing I know, my alarm was going, off like that. So it's a nice morning. I've been told that it's gonna be like this all day, pretty clear skies, bit of sunshine. I won't bet any money on it though, because this place is mental when it comes to the weather. <laughs> Something I forgot to mention actually, my feet. During my last walk, Matty gave me some Vaseline that I put on my feet. I think it was probably a little bit too late to use by that time, but I've been using it every day and my feet are just 100% all the time. So yeah, just took a bit of fresh water. Got a water source running right next to me. Hopefully it'll be a nice day today. Let's see what it brings. 
I hope it's not. I hope I've gone past all the thick of the boggy oh, sort of parts. As I passed all the burial mounds yesterday, my man took a deep journey, playing out the early interment rites they might have had around here regarding death, covering the steepest areas in the walk and facing harsh winds and hailstorms, then moving on towards the flats and eventually into the bogland, emerging into a bright, clear, still day. I feel my spirit witnessing a renewal of life after death experience, which plagued my imagination with a sense of a much different lifestyle our Bronze Age ancestors would have had. This place is forged with the corpses of those who fell to the hostility of the land. Only the strongest man, plant and beast would reign over this region, but eventually, even the most hardened warrior would succumb to time, leaving their knowledge to the next of kin. At around 4300 BC, the Neolithic period begins in Britain, where famine began to very slowly sweep across the land, with a dramatic effect on the lives of the inhabitants and the natural order. For the first time in history, people were forced to cooperate, and the family home was born, which later created an explosion in the population, due primarily to the fact that it was much easier to bear and raise children. The flint axe was the supreme farming tool of the day, and with the knowledge of how to harness fire, hundreds of miles of forest was decimated in order to plant crops and raise animals, but this did not come without a heavy price. New diseases such as syphilis, tuberculosis, smallpox, bubonic plague came from living within close proximity of the animals. Farming requires more effort than the life of the hunter-gatherer, and although it come with the benefit of storing food, they also had to protect their assets from raiders, who would also use the flint axe and fire to take in one night what the farmer would work all season for. In this lawless culture, it would have been common to witness a skirmish or a late night raid which resulted in fatalities. Families eventually formed together which gave rise to the tribe. This particular piece of land was the territory of the Brigantes or the hill dwellers which the name suggests who occupied North, South and West Yorkshire, Durham, Northumberland, Derbyshire, Lancashire, Merseyside, Greater Manchester and all the smaller modern counties in between. I'll typically do a good amount of research on an area before I'll explore it. This helps me travel through time and get a feel of what our ancestors would perceive. Although we have new landmarks built, you'll typically find out that once you've stepped so far out, then the shape of the land begins to tell its own version of a story that could not have been passed down by mankind. You're right there. Done a bit of mileage today, so I just thought I'd come and stop and have a bit of a chat, really. I'm in this place, as you can see, behind me. <laughs> I'll tell you what, what a beautiful place. There's, there's sometimes I'll find my way into like some certain spot and I'll really look around and I just think, wow. I am so lucky to be alive in a place like this. I'll tell you what. All, all, the, all the pains, aches, everything, it's worth it. Absolutely, totally worth it. Yeah, so just plodding on. Everywhere where it's crappy, I just, again, like I say, I just, yeah, I get my little rhythm, listen to my walking stick tapping, listen to the music. Uh, the land makes out here. And it's absolutely amazing. And when I'm in a place like this, I, uh, I tend to reflect a lot and, and think a lot about, about the past really, about what's happened, where I'm going. This place really does help. Although I'm suited up for a nomadic hike across the countryside, I've been putting myself into a time where the British hunter-gatherer transitions into a farmer. I can see how appealing it must have been to go from being on the move to settling in a place by a river like the one you've just seen. A societal structure would have been similar to the ones we see today. Families living in a roundhouse, agreements on certain morals and principles, laws and punishments for those who overstepped the ethical infrastructure. The head of the family would typically own a stone or bronze age tool depending on the time. 
this would have been the equivalent of owning a car in today's world. We don't know exactly how things were politically speaking, but we can pretty much almost guarantee you would have had a hierarchy, where the elites would have taxed and stored surplus resources. The Brigantes was the largest tribe in Britain by the time of the Roman invasion, but it was made up of different clans. Life was still no utopia out here. Farming brought more stability to the family home. Babies now had a 50% chance of being born, which is still an increase from the nomadic lifestyle. But life was still full of uncertainties, as farming also brought warfare. One in ten skeletal remains have been found with signs of violence. The life expectancy for a father or husband was five years less than the hunter-gatherer, but an enormous improvement for a family. By submerging myself within this landscape, and unintentionally having to endure the bad weather, I'll be walking away with a well-appreciated glimpse into the unimaginable characteristics of the early people of North Yorkshire, who against all odds contributed to producing one of the most formidable species the world has ever seen, mankind. Right, so I'm on a little bit of a mission now. I've reached the end where my day is supposed to be, and to be honest with you, it's been bloody difficult with the weather because when the sun's out like now, I can feel a bit warmth, but I need a big winter jacket on. But as soon as it goes behind a cloud, for a few seconds, my hands uh, just they start stinging with a cold. It really is that sort of bad, you know, sort of biting into me. So, what I'm hoping to do tonight, can't guarantee it, but I'm in a bit of a rush now, and pretty much, <laughs> I think I've pretty much sort of seen everything anywhere, you know, as far as Moorland goes. It's just bloody, it all looks the same, really. So, I'm gonna, I'm gonna rush on, maybe do another five miles or something, and go to a place I know to be safe where I can definitely have a nice warm fire. I can get my head down. And I can have a really easy start in the morning because I'd only have probably about four or five miles left to do. So I'll, uh, I'll record whatever I can record, anything out of any interest I'll get. But if it's just more moorland, I'm just gonna fuck it off. So, I'll see you soon. Time's beginning to creep up on me. My pace begins to speed up. My body's taken a beating, not only off the land, but also from the elements. Half of this trek's been nothing but flat, wet, boggy ever moorland, with very little to see. No wonder the early people of Britain perceived this as uninhabitable to the living. I can totally see where there was coming from in the belief that only the dead may reside here. There aren't even enough resources to pitch up for a single night. When I settle for the night, I'll have done 18 miles, which almost completes the walk. Only one more night to endure in the frost, with only a jungle sleeping bag to protect me from the weather. You're right there. I'm at the end of my last day on the Lake Wake Walk, and I've got a nice toasty fire going this time. <laughs> the, today's walk has been absolutely, unbelievably excruciating. It is like every every strand of muscle in my body is hurting in some way. Uh, aches, pains things my shoulder feels like it's been hit by a fucking lump hammer <laughs> but that's what it's about innit got to enjoy all these things to have a good time as I said this walk it's a lot about um, it's got a lot to do with death and like I say I it makes you it really does make you think about life, death and 
where your life's going, um, what move are you going to do next. It's like a game of chess. And it serves, a walk like this serves as a painful reminder <laughs> that life is fucking hard <laughs> sometimes. Well, I said I'd dedicate this one to all the loved ones, people close to me who's passed away. But I just hope uh, if they saw any of this after they stopped laughing, I hope they're really proud of me. Don't really have much else to say. Right there, I'm back on track and to be perfectly honest with you, I do think I made a really wise call last night. I really did not want to do the extra mileage but it was so chilly last night. I, I had a fire going and everything and as the fire was going out put more wood on about two or three times but each time it was going out it, it got really bitter and it just really bit into me and and that was when I while I was surrounded by four walls as well so yeah that was definitely a good call but I had a good sleep anyway last night really good sleep I sort of nerf, nursed myself into decent enough condition to sort of carry on today. I was a bit worried about that actually because when I got there I pretty much seized up and it took me I'd say the best part of an hour and a half to get myself sorted because I couldn't really move anything. I was, it was really really was agonising. But as for this morning, sun's out, it's a beautiful day. I did come across one thing last night that I did actually feel a bit of a shame, I couldn't really talk about it. I just did not have the time to. And it was Leela Cross. And legend has it that in 626 AD, they built a monument over the grave of Leela who was an officer in the court of Edwin, King of Northumbria. He stepped in the way of an assassin's blade, giving his life to save the king. At the time, the king was still a pagan, and the death of Lila inspired him to convert to Christianity. This place has been shrouded in myths, legends and untold truths for thousands of years. You can't help but feel a deep grounding relationship with the highest degree in an area like this. As I walked to the finish line, I reflected on the journey I made this last few days. It in itself has been a rite of passage. Like I left an unwanted part of myself to rest in the snow re-emerged in the light and warmth of the morning of my birthday. As my body became tired and weak, my spirit grew stronger. Our Celtic ancestors believed more in cycles than they did in a beginning and an end. The land has been kind enough to gift me with a perfect example of this. This has been freak weather for an April in England, and a part of me felt like there was a malevolence out there trying to torment me. But now I see it more as an education. One no other living human being can bestow upon us. I feel eternally grateful as I step through the doorway into another year, knowing that something out there is forever watching over me, guarding my soul. I mentioned earlier that this walk was named after a song. During the course of my old trip, the words was playing in my head. If 
fueling me to get to this point. I spent a lot of time visualising my goal, muttering the words of the lightweight gauge. 